Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. Happy autumn to all of you. I hope if you celebrated the equinox, that went well for you. And those of you that are gonna be celebrating Michaelmas coming up, I hope that your preparations are going well. So I wanna preface this video by saying that I know that we have a huge diversity of uh, sociological, political, ideological, and interrelational experiences and beliefs. And that can really come into play, that whole cohort of complications can come into play when we're talking about having relationships with our neighbors. So I really wanted to discuss today how we in permaculture, how those of us who are homesteaders or gardeners or people seeking to live a more sustainable life, how we can view relationships with neighbors. How can we be a good neighbor and follow the principles of permaculture, the ethics of permaculture, and use our relationships with our neighbors in a productive way to be more sustainable? So I'm in this homesteading group and there's a gajillion members, I don't know, probably like 120,000 members. So again, assumption right off the bat, this group is wildly diverse, right? And there was a question asked like, what do you think makes a good neighbor? And I think there were 400 and something replies. And I read all of them and I actually made a whole bunch of notes because I thought, this is a really fascinating topic. This is a really fascinating poll. I know what I feel makes a good neighbor, what I want from my neighbors and how I try to interact myself with my neighbors. But I wonder what other people think, particularly folks that are focused on homesteading and um, kind of living a either self-sufficient or, um, you know, kind of, independent lifestyle. So as I mined through all of the comments and took notes and paid attention to what everybody was saying in this thread, I saw patterns emerging and out of the uh, input that people had in this thread, I came up with four categories of good neighbors and they all have a place depending on who you are as a person, your needs, who your neighbors are as people. So I wanna go through what I feel are the four kinds of good neighbors that we can have and how we can talk about which one we want to be and which one fits best in our lives and in our communities. Now in permaculture, we talk about, again, I say this all the time on this channel, site-specific design. There is no one size fits all solution. And that is absolutely true when we talk about what is a good neighbor. There's no one archetype of what makes a good neighbor, but there are key components. And so that's why I came up with four kind of categories, four kind of um, ideal good neighbors that different people uh, hold in their mind as an image of what they want from a neighbor. And I think it's really important when we're talking about these four categories going forward that um, it's not just what we want as a neighbor, it's also finding out what our neighbors want and need as a neighbor. Because it's not just our own needs we're trying to fulfill, we do live in a community. And you can assume what kind of neighbor your neighbor wants you to be and uh, totally screw it up and get it really wrong. So it's good to have data points and understand your neighbor's perspective and step into their shoes and not just say, I'm going to be the kind of neighbor I want, but also I need to figure out what kind of neighbor my neighbors need. Number one, the non-existent neighbor. This was the most frequent reply in this thread about what makes a good neighbor. The replies were, I don't want neighbors. Keep them all at least a half a mile away from me. Stay in your lane. Ignore each other. Mind your own business. I prefer not to talk to my neighbors or know them at all. So I was not surprised to see in a group focused on homesteading, there was a kind of a mentality that you would expect from a homesteading group. We want to go live in the country. We want to have space from other people. We want to exit the hustle and bustle of the city. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to live on our own. We are rugged individualists. That's a very common theme in kind of American homesteading. And so I wasn't surprised to see this kind of like, I want non-existent neighbors. I want neighbors that like, they mind their business, I mind mine, and we don't interact with each other. And I keep to myself. And not necessarily antisocial, but kind of super independent, super self-sufficient and non-relational. 
So maybe that's the kind of neighbor that you are. Maybe that's the kind of neighbor that um, your neighbors want you to be, but that's a valid way to be a good neighbor. I know uh, with a couple of my neighbors, that's sort of the relationship that we have. We just mind our own business and we just don't interact at all. Um, I don't get up in their business. They don't get up in my business and that's all, all there is to the relationship and that works for both of us. Number two, the neutral neighbor. Please forgive me, I love alliteration, so all of these types of neighbors are going to start with N. So the second most common response in this group was to have a neighbor that doesn't totally ignore you and actually thinks about your well-being and thinks about uh, politeness, right? The basic, most rudimentary level of politeness. So this neutral neighbor is not one that seeks out positive interactions with you, but they are the kind of neighbor that is conscious of not inflicting negative interactions upon you. So the neutral neighbor keeps their animals on their own property. This was probably the most common uh, note about what this kind of neighbor should do. And I think that's very true in homesteading groups. I see all the time, my neighbor's turkeys are on my property again, eating in my garden, or my neighbor's cows are getting out, or um, forgive me, my chickens have gotten out a few times. I know for us in past years, we had issues with a really aggressive dog of one of my neighbors constantly getting out. And when I had small children, it was a really big safety risk. So keeping your livestock and your pets on your own property. Someone also mentioned keeping your cats inside. And I know in, in Portland, that's a big issue. Uh, outdoor cats coming and pooping in people's gardens, killing songbirds at their bird baths. So that's another layer of that. Keep your animals on your own property. That way you are not having your animals get out and inflict harm on your neighbor's property. Being conscious of noise in the neighborhood barking dogs going on for hours and hours. If you've watched some of my videos, that is an issue I have all the time. And of course, as somebody who um, prefers to have direct interaction and I prefer to go and talk to my neighbor, I have no problem going over and being like, your dog has been barking for three solid hours. Could you please be courteous and uh, take them into the house and realize that the noise affects everybody in the neighborhood. Someone mentioned discharging firearms or fireworks and being conscious of neighbors that are veterans, um, neighbors that maybe have PTSD and just like neighbors with animals, right? Cause those things can really be detrimental. Someone talked about loud music early in the morning and late in the night, just the bare minimum of politeness. How is this loud noise coming from my property drifting onto my neighbor's property? How can I reduce the harm that I'm causing? Another one that I've had to deal with quite a bit is being conscious of trees overhanging the property line and pesticides and herbicides used along the property line. Anything that happens on the property line is a potential cause of um, unintentional harm. So I want to be conscious of my trees that need frequent pruning along the property line so they don't overhang into my neighbor's yard where they shouldn't. I want to be conscious if I have trees on this side of my property. I have a quince tree that tends to drop fruit over the fence that I'm diligent about picking it up on my neighbor's side of the property. Also being really conscientious of the fact that pesticides and herbicides sprayed along the property line impact your neighbor's property right on the other side of the fence. So that's kind of the neutral neighbor's outlook, right? That sometimes that's all folks want from their neighbor. Just please don't cause harm. Just be aware of reducing harm. And that's it. That's the minimum I expect. Basic politeness, basic like taking a second to think, what does my neighbor need? Tagging onto this, I think that this was not mentioned in the group at all, but I've seen it in many, many homesteading and gardening groups where folks are really eager, really trigger happy to start a war with their neighbor over misunderstandings, over small issues of not uh, reducing harm, small issues of not being conscientious, like pruning uh, a tree too far over the fence line so that you're actually pruning your neighbor's tree on their side of the property. Trees grow back. So for me, I think it's really important to practice de-escalation. If all you want is that kind of neutral relationship where the two of you are focusing on just uh, being considerate, it's really good to take a deep breath and say, if something happened that was inconsiderate, can I just let it go? Can I just let it go or do I need to escalate it? 
what will happen if I escalate it? And are the consequences gonna be worse than just saying, okay, my neighbor sprayed some Roundup along the fence line. I've talked to them about it four times. I've offered to weed along the fence line and they're still doing it. Do I need to get up in their face or can I just like take a deep breath and say, this is not the hill I wanna die on. I think that's really important if you want to be a neutral neighbor and you want to maintain neutral relationships with your neighbors. Number three is the nominal neighbor. So with the non-existent neighbor, you're not extending anything to them at all and you're not even really thinking about them. You're minding your business, they're minding theirs. With the neutral neighbor, you are having this extension of empathy. You are thinking about reducing harm and you are being aware that your actions have uh, an impact on people around you. So it is a desire to reduce harm and not inflict negative things on our neighbors. The nominal neighbor goes a step further and you can see here we're slowly building a little bit more and a little bit more of a relational aspect with our neighbors. So the nominal neighbor, not only do they seek to reduce harm by not calling the cops on their uh, POC and queer neighbors, by uh, making sure that they are keeping their animals on their own property, by making sure that they are conscious of how things that happen on their property may impact folks around them. They also seek to do those small neighborly things that are a positive impact. So we have harm reduction, and then we have intentional positive uh, interactions. So waving and saying hi when you pass each other. This was a comment that came up quite a bit in this thread on this homesteading group. It was like, all I really want from my neighbor is for them to just be friendly and say hi. I don't really wanna have a deep conversation with them. I don't really wanna tell them details about my life, but we can just be polite to each other. We can be civil and um, we don't have to pretend the other person doesn't exist. That's kind of weird. So I'll just say, hi, how's it going? enjoying the weather, that's it. But it can go beyond that. And I think with the nominal neighbor, this includes things like checking on the elderly. That was a frequent theme, especially in rural communities. But even here in Portland, we have an elderly neighbor across the street and I try and touch base with her on a regular basis. And I think that that is really important. The elderly can often be really isolated. And uh, so being a non-existent neighbor, you don't have it on your radar when something critical could happen to your elderly neighbor and when they need more support. So the nominal neighbor checks in on the elderly and has in the back of their mind when there is inclement weather or difficult circumstances that they uh, have an eye on their neighbor and are checking in on their welfare. The nominal neighbor also does things like perhaps out of nowhere without asking, shovel the walkway or driveway of their neighbor on a snowy day. Someone mentioned that they knew their neighbor was in reduced financial circumstances. They aren't friends, but they noticed their neighbor's gravel driveway had a lot of big uh, ruts in it. And so they bought gravel and filled in the ruts at the end of the driveway for their neighbor. Offering garden produce was a big one that came up in this group. Offering eggs, honey if you've got bees, excess garden produce. It's just a really easy way to extend goodwill to your neighbor without having to have them be your best friend, right? Number four. This is what I call the nucleus neighbor. Now, nucleus means the center of activity from which relationships and connections grow, right? So. I'm thinking about if you're making an attempt to have nucleus neighbor relationships, you're thinking about how the core of your community begins with your neighbors and that that is the central place from which we can radiate out community connections. So that's why I picked that word and also again, alliteration. So. Nucleus neighbors. This is my next door neighbors, Ben and Allie, who bought their house the same week we bought ours and um, Ben's basically like my brother, so we just have a fabulous relationship with them. They put up with all of our eccentricities, and um, this is where you, you have your neighbor's phone number, and you text them and be like, hey, there's a package on your porch. I know you're at work. You want me to snag it for you and keep it safe until you get home from work? Um, this is where you text your neighbor, or you call them, or you chat over the fence. Hey, I'm going out of town for the weekend. Can you feed my chickens? Can you feed my goats? Can you make sure my cats are fed? You might babysit for each other. You might sit out on your driveways on a summer evening and hang out while one of your neighbors plays the guitar and your kids run around and play with sidewalk chalk. 
you bring over baked goods to your neighbor. If they are having a hard time, if they've had surgery, if they've had a baby, you take them food. You chat over the fence, but it's not like the nominal neighbor where you're like, hey, how's it going? Really sunny today. I'm looking forward to the rain coming this weekend. With a nucleus neighbor, you have more in-depth conversations. You are friends and you're intentional about having conversations. You're intentional about asking them how things are going in their life. You're intentional about getting to know the needs in their life and making an effort to help meet those needs with their consent. So other things that nucleus neighbors do for each other, you might share tools. And if you borrow somebody's tool, you return it well oiled or filled up with gas if it is a gas powered tool. You let each other know about community happenings, what happened at the neighborhood association meeting, things like that. You let each other know about like, hey, somebody at the end of the street has a bunch of wood out on the corner for free. I think your firewood pile is low. Do you wanna go get it? Like you just look out for each other and Having a nucleus neighbor means that you are building those community connections and that builds resilience. For me, I have all four of these kinds of neighbors surrounding me in my neighborhood, and I'm okay with all of that. I don't need everybody to be Ben and Allie next door. I don't need everybody to be basically family that lives around me. I think that would feel kind of suffocating if that were the case. In this homesteading group, I know people want that rugged individualism. I know they want self-sufficiency. And I have spoken a bazillion times on this channel about how I don't think self-sufficiency is a good goal. I don't think it's realistic. I don't think it helps us as a species. It doesn't help our communities. And I think that it's a fallacy that we can achieve complete self-sufficiency. We just can't. We are stronger when we are more interconnected. So for permaculture, the second ethic is people care. Community is people care. People care requires skills. So much of permaculture is skill building. And I think folks can focus on the agricultural skill building or the um, building structures skill building and can kind of um, overlook the fact that communication skills, um, emotional intelligence skills, and relational skills are key to having good permaculture and being resilient people. I envision a community where you can have good relationships with many of your neighbors on the levels that you all need. I think it's really important to assume positive intent. I think that, I've, I've said it before on this channel, but I think that is the most important skill either in social media spaces where we are interacting uh, around permaculture or homesteading but also in real life with our neighbors, assume positive intent. Assume the best about people's words. Don't read things into them that are not there. Assume that folks interactions with you, if your neighbor accidentally pruned your tree a little bit too far over the property line, please don't assume that that was malicious. Please make a conscious effort to assume positive intent. I promise you everything will go much easier if you aren't suspicious and paranoid and assuming your neighbors are out to get you. Starting off by not automatically default assuming the worst of their words and pausing for a second and saying, Maybe I misread that. Maybe I'm applying a tone that's not there. Maybe I am assuming sarcasm when there is none. I'm just gonna pause for a second and take that at face value and see if that changes the way I interact with this person. If you have the opportunity to take DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, that's really, really a great way to build skills for interacting with other people and having good relationships with neighbors. One of the key components in DBT, I've talked about this in another video as well, is distress tolerance. That is, how can we keep ourselves from winding up emotionally and um, taking our feelings out on other people or on ourselves in a harmful way when we are distressed? How can we tolerate our distress? That can be something as much as, uh, how do I calm myself down and recenter myself when my neighbor's dog has been barking for four hours and I can't get a video filmed and it's driving me crazy? So I, that I don't go lash out at my neighbor. How can I practice 
tolerating the distress that I'm feeling. And there's a whole lot of skills in DBT for that. And for me, I found them incredibly useful in online spaces and with folks in my neighborhood to have distress tolerance skills. So I really encourage you to look at that. I'll put again, some links in the description to some good workbooks and resources for DBT. So in closing of the four types of neighbors, the non-existent neighbor, the neutral neighbor, the nominal neighbor, and the nucleus neighbor, what kind of neighbor do you strive to be to your neighbors? And more importantly, what kind of neighbor do they want? So it's really important. You may want to have a relationship where you are bosom friends with your next door neighbor and like they are not interested. So in seeking to have any of these four kinds of relationships, get consent. Find out what needs your neighbors have and stick to those needs. And also see if you can clearly communicate what you are hoping to have out of a neighbor. In order to build resilience, what kinds of skills do you need to add to have better and more fruitful relationships with your neighbors? I also promise those skills will transfer to your family and your workplace and your online interactions as well. So how can we use the permaculture ethic of people care to be a better homestead neighbor, to be a better quirky gardening neighbor, to be a better urban neighbor right up on top of those folks living around us? How can we think about the ethic of people care to not only meet our own needs, but meet the needs of our neighbors and understand that it's a mutually beneficial relationship and focus on the beneficial part of it. Focus on the fact that any of these four kinds of neighbors that your neighbor may want you to be is a good thing. Focusing on de-escalation, focusing on assuming positive intent, focusing on building those skills, have really good and productive relationships with your neighbors is so important for your own resilience, your own peace of mind, and enjoying your permaculture garden or your homestead. So I hope that was helpful for you as we look at becoming resilient people, as we look at becoming people who live a regenerative way of um, existing on this earth. It's impossible to do that without thinking about the relationships with those living around us. So I really encourage you to dive deep into social permaculture and see how you can reap the benefits of it. See how it can help make all of the rest of your homesteading, all of the rest of your resilient living that much more centered peaceful and productive. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and click subscribe. I also have some ways you can support this channel down in the description. Thanks.